This is Debt Free in 30, where every week we take 30 minutes and talk to industry experts about debt, money, and personal finance. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. Usually here on Debt Free in 30, we talk about how to get out of debt and live debt free. So what happens if you follow the advice we give on this show and you eliminate your debt? Then what? What if I had to do a consumer proposal or bankruptcy to eliminate my debt and now I'm out of debt and I want to get back on track? How do I do that? That's what we're going to talk about today here on Debt Free in 30. How to recover financially after a bankruptcy, consumer proposal, or other major financial event. I want you to take full advantage of your new debt-free status, so today we'll cover the practical steps you can take to recover financially after a consumer proposal or bankruptcy and rebuild your credit for the long term. Now, let me start by saying that I don't advise anyone immediately after a consumer proposal or bankruptcy to go right back out and start borrowing again. If you got into trouble because you had access to too much credit, you don't want to go back to having those same problems again. However, in today's modern electronic economy, access to credit is very important to some people. If someday you want to buy a house or finance a car, you need a good credit score. And today we're going to discuss tangible steps you can take to improve your credit score after a consumer proposal or bankruptcy. Perhaps you don't plan to buy a house. Perhaps you drive an older car and when it needs to be replaced, you'll pay cash for an inexpensive vehicle. Maybe you live in the city and don't need a car. That's great. Perhaps you don't plan to borrow any money in the future, but you may still need access to credit. Why? Because there are likely going to be times when you'll need the use of a credit card. Even if you plan to pay cash, it's difficult to book a hotel room if you don't have a credit card. Even something as simple as a service like Netflix often requires a credit card for the monthly payment, although there are other options like using PayPal. You may have cut your cable TV to save money, and that's great, and Netflix or a similar service may be a lot cheaper than cable TV, but if you don't have PayPal or some other way to make your monthly payment, you may need a credit card to set up the service. Perhaps you gave up your car to save money, and now for that occasional long trip you rent a car because it's a lot cheaper than owning a car. Again, that's great, but to rent a car you often need a credit card. So how do you get a credit card and start rebuilding credit if you have bad credit? That's what we're going to talk about today, starting right now. I recommend a five-step credit rebuilding plan. Step number one, set your goals. You may be listening to this and saying, forget about my goals, I want to rebuild my credit, so let's get on with it. I get it, but I think it's very important that you decide why you are trying to rebuild your credit before you actually get started because your goals will determine your next steps. If your goal is to get a credit card so you can book a hotel room, the steps to take are a lot simpler than the steps you need to take if you want to get a mortgage someday. That's why goals are important. Your goal may be something simple like getting a credit card with a small credit limit so you can book a hotel, rent a car, or purchase goods online. Your goal may be larger, like financing a car or buying a house. Maybe your financial goals have nothing to do with credit. Perhaps you want to save money so that you can send your children to college. Perhaps you want to save for your own retirement. Savings goals are different than credit goals, so it's important to set your goals so you know what steps you need to take next. So here's my advice. Get a piece of paper or open a document on your computer and write down every possible goal you can think of. Big or small, write them all down. Simple goals, crazy goals, even goals that you may never be able to achieve, write them all down. Goals I would consider would include credit goals like qualifying for a car loan, getting a mortgage, getting a credit card, getting a home renovation loan, getting a student loan to go back to school. Savings goals could include things like saving money for a security deposit for a car, saving money for a down payment for a house, saving money for your child's or grandchild's education, or saving money for retirement. Write down all of your goals and make them as specific as possible. Put dollar amounts with them and time frames. I want to buy a house is a goal, but it's not very specific. Write down, I want to buy a house for $300,000 and I want to save up a $60,000 down payment and I want to buy the house within five years. Well, that's a very specific, measurable goal. Now that you have all of your goals, 
rank them in order of importance to you. Which one do you want to accomplish first? Which is the most important? Once you're done, you'll have a clearly defined set of goals with amounts and time frames. For some of you, this will be easy. Your only goal is to buy an inexpensive car so you can start immediately. Other goals may be more difficult and may require some research. For example, you can save for a house or for retirement many different ways, including through a TFSA or an RRSP. Which is better? Well, that depends on your age and some other factors, so some research may be required to fine-tune your goals. Once your goals are set, it's time to move on to step number two. Step number two. This may seem obvious, but step number two is to eliminate all unnecessary debt. If you're in a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy, this means completing all of your payments and other duties to complete the process as fast as possible. Many credit rebuilding steps can't happen until your proposal or bankruptcy is done, so the sooner you can finish making your payments and completing your other duties, the sooner you can take steps to actively rebuild your credit. Information on your credit report remains for a predetermined period of time, which is why finishing your bankruptcy or consumer proposal on time is important. When you file a bankruptcy or a consumer proposal, a note is placed on your credit report indicating the type of filing and the date of filing. When you're discharged, another note will appear indicating the date of discharge from your bankruptcy or the date your proposal was completed. For example, for a first bankruptcy, Equifax will display the information about your bankruptcy for six years from the date of discharge. For a consumer proposal, Equifax will display the details of your proposal for three years from the date of the completion of your proposal. That's why you rebuild your credit score faster by paying off your consumer proposal faster. If it takes five years to pay off your proposal, the note on Equifax appears on your credit report for a total of eight years. Five years for the proposal plus an additional three years until the note is automatically purged. If you pay the proposal off in three years, the note would remain for a total of six years. Bottom line, the sooner you finish your proposal, the sooner the note is removed from your credit report. Step number three. Step number three in rebuilding your credit is to make sure that all of your new credit decisions are focused on using debt wisely. By using debt wisely, I mean making sure that you don't take on any unnecessary debt, only borrow as much as you can repay, don't carry any high interest credit card debt, and avoid expensive options like payday loans. I see a lot of people who run into a cash crunch and they go and get a payday loan or other short-term loan to stay afloat. That is almost always a bad idea. Many payday loan lenders don't report to the credit bureau, so you may think, hey, it's no big deal getting a payday loan. While it may not impact your credit report, payday loans have a much more serious impact on your ability to rebuild your credit, high interest. Even something as simple as getting a credit card to rebuild your credit can lead to problems if you don't pay it off in full every month. So how can you avoid falling back into the debt trap? Well, you need a strong savings plan, and that leads us to step number four. The fourth step in rebuilding your credit is to save money. There are actually three reasons why saving money is a good idea. First, banks like to lend money to people who don't need it. If you have money in the bank, the bank is more likely to want to consider you a better risk, so it's easier to get a loan. Second, as you're rebuilding your credit, it's likely that you'll require a higher down payment or security deposit when you borrow. So having savings is a good idea. Third, if you have some emergency savings set aside, you're much less likely to turn once again to really bad credit options like a payday loan, a bank overdraft, or credit card debt. If you want to finance a car, having a $3,000 down payment will make it easier to get a good interest rate on your new loan than if you had only a $500 deposit. The higher the down payment, the less risk to the lender, so the more likely they are to give you the loan at favorable rates. If your goal is to buy a house, a down payment is critical. At a minimum, you need a 5% down payment, but if you have less than perfect credit, and you want the best rate, a 20% or greater down payment is recommended. Currently in Canada, mortgage insurance is required if you have less than a 20% down payment. Mortgage insurance increases the cost of your mortgage. For example, if you only have a 5% down payment, 
meaning your mortgage is 95% of the value of the home, mortgage insurance through CMHC is a 3.6% premium on the value of the total loan. That's a big number. So if you buy a $300,000 house with only 5% down, that's a $15,000 down payment, you pay a CMHC mortgage insurance premium of 3.6% of the $285,000 mortgage or $10,260. So when you buy the house, you either have to pay an extra $10,260 up front or it gets added to your mortgage. So now your mortgage, instead of being $285,000, is $295,260. That's a big difference. In most cases, if you have a 20% down payment, the bank won't charge you a mortgage insurance premium. So by having a decent sized down payment, you save a lot of money. I said that step one was to set your goals, and now you can see why. If your goal is to buy a house, you need to know what the house will cost and how much of a down payment you'll need so that you have a savings goal in mind, which will save you a lot of money and help you borrow at a much cheaper rate. A lot of people ask me, what's the best way to save? The answer is, make it easy. It has to be automatic or else you may not do it. If your goal is to save $200 a month as the first step towards rebuilding your credit and you get paid every week, I would have the bank set it up to automatically transfer $50 every payday to my savings account. The money would be automatically transferred so I won't see it, so I'm much less likely to spend it. The next question I get asked is where to put the money? In a savings account or a tax-free savings account or a registered retirement savings plan or somewhere else? The answer again depends on your goals. If you're saving money to buy a house, either a TFSA or an RRSP may be a good option. The answer will depend on a number of factors including your tax rate today and what you expect it to be in the future and how much contribution room you have and when you need the money. The answer is going to be different for everyone. An RRSP is a tax deferral method, meaning you get a tax deduction today when you put the money in your RRSP, but you pay tax on it when you take it out. So if you're off on maternity leave this year and not paying much in taxes, it may not make sense to contribute to your RRSP today and save a small amount of tax, only to withdraw it at some time in the future when your tax rate is higher. In that case, a TFSA may be a better option. With a tax-free savings account, you don't get a tax break when you put the money in, but you can withdraw the money, including any interest or capital gains, tax-free. So if your income is lower now but will be higher in the future, a TFSA may be a good option. With an RRSP, you can withdraw money and use it as a down payment on a home purchase, but then starting the year after you buy your home, you have to repay it over no longer than 15 years with a payment of at least 1 15th each year. If you don't pay it back, it gets automatically added to your income and you pay the tax that year. So again, if you're in a higher tax bracket in the future, that may be costly. So again, my advice is to set your goals and then make a plan to achieve those goals. With that background, it's time for step number five, the important step, reestablishing credit. So we're gonna take a quick break and be right back with some practical advice on how to rebuild credit. You're listening to Debt Free in 30 with Doug Hoyes. We'll be right back. Welcome back to this special credit rebuilding episode of Debt Free in 30. As we discussed in the first segment, if you want to rebuild your credit, you need to set your goals, eliminate your debt, avoid any unnecessary new debt, and begin a savings plan so that you have cash to use as a security deposit or down payment on whatever you're borrowing for. Step number five is to take specific steps to rebuild your credit. More specifically, you want to improve your credit score. What's a credit score? Well, with Equifax, your Equifax credit score is a number between 300 and 900. 300 is the worst, 900 is the best, so a higher number is better. Any number over 760 is excellent and would generally allow you to get a loan at the best rates. 729 to 759 is very good, 660 to 724 is good, 560 to 659 is fair, and anything below 560 is poor. So your first goal is to get your credit score above 560 because if it's below 560 you'll have a very difficult time borrowing. Your next goal is to get over 660 so that you're in the good range and ultimately you want to get over 760 which is excellent credit. Let me emphasize a very important point here. 
Your credit score is for the bank's benefit, not for your benefit. Credit scores are designed to help the bank decide if they should lend to you. They are there for the bank's benefit, not your benefit. So again, your credit score is only important if you want to borrow in the future. How important is it? Well, I can't tell you for sure, but a recent study showed the following results. In the survey, the person was trying to borrow $15,000 for a car loan for 48 months. If they had a great credit score of 760, they could borrow with zero down at a 4.8% interest rate or about $344 per month. With a score of 590, which is only fair, they needed a 10% down payment or equivalent trade-in and the interest rate was 16.5%, which is $429 a month. A credit score of 490, which is poor, resulted in a 20% down payment required and an interest rate of 29% for a monthly payment of $531. So it's possible to borrow with poor credit, but in this example, the difference between an excellent credit score and a poor credit score was almost $9,000 in extra payments on a $15,000 car loan over four years. That's huge. And that's why you want a good credit score before you try to borrow. The same math applies if you're buying a house. Most lenders will want you to have a credit score of 600 or more before they'll give you a mortgage. And A lenders, like the banks, typically want 650 or more. So what's used to calculate your credit score? Equifax and TransUnion won't tell us because they don't want people trying to game the system. But here are the factors we believe go into your credit score. 35% of it is based on your payment history, 30% on the amounts owed, 15% on the length of the credit history, 10% on new credit, and 10% is the types of credit used. So to improve your credit score, you need to work to improve each credit scoring factor. Payment history is the biggest one, so you want to pay off all your obligations on time. Most cell phone companies now report to the credit bureau, so you want to make sure you're paying your cell phone bill, for example, on time. If you're late, it will negatively impact your credit score. Amounts owed is the next most important factor, and utilization is important. Utilization is the percentage of allowable credit that you're using. If I have a credit card with a $10,000 limit, and I'm carrying a balance of $2,000, that's a 20% utilization. Your goal should be to keep utilization below 30% and ideally below 20%. In most cases, the lower the better. If you have a credit card, pay it off in full each month to keep your utilization low. Length of credit history is important, but that doesn't mean you should carry a balance forever. The longer you have had a trade line, the better, like a credit card or a bank loan, but you also don't want to have too much debt. So there's a balancing act here. Time also refers to other areas, like the length of time at your current address and the length of time at your current job. If you move frequently, that will lower your credit score because you appear to be less stable. Same with constantly changing jobs. It may hurt your credit score. If you plan to move around a lot, it may be wise to keep a permanent address, like at your parents' house, to keep your credit score as high as possible. New credit and the types of credit used are the least important factors, but they're still important. Qualifying for one small new credit card is new credit, and it may help you qualify for the next trade line. So to improve your credit score, here's what I recommend. First, have cash in the bank. We've already discussed why that's important, but it's very important, so I mention it again. The next step is to establish two trade lines. A trade line is a debt that appears on your credit report. It could be a credit card or bank loan or line of credit. A car loan or an RSP loan would be a trade line as long as the lender reports it to the credit bureau. That's a key point because some debts don't appear on your credit report. If you owe back taxes to Canada Revenue Agency, that's a debt, but CRA doesn't report to the credit bureau, so it's not a trade line and therefore doesn't improve your credit score. A possible next step would be to get a secured credit card. There are a few places that do this, and I'll put links in the show notes over on hoys.com to show you how to do it. With a secured credit card, you place funds on deposit with the credit card company, and they give you a credit card. 
A typical example would be to put down a cash deposit of $1,000 and you get a credit card with a $1,000 credit limit. It works just like a regular credit card except that your credit limit is only as high as the amount of cash you have on deposit. Secured credit cards generally also charge a monthly fee, so even if you're paying the balance in full each month, there is still a charge for using the card. If you don't pay in full each month, you pay a huge amount in interest, so my advice is always pay your credit card in full each month. A secured credit card reports to the credit bureau just like a regular credit card. It will show that you have $1,000 in authorized credit, and as we discussed earlier, your goal is to keep your utilization as low as possible, which is why you want to pay it off in full every month. I know some people who use their card to buy gas, and then they go home and make a payment on their card, so they are never in debt. So getting a secured credit card is a good way to establish a trade line on your credit report. You need to have cash for the security deposit, which is why the savings plan is so important. Who will qualify? It depends on the lender. Some credit card lenders will only give you a secured credit card once you are discharged from bankruptcy. Most of them will allow you to get a secured card while you're in a consumer proposal once the proposal is accepted by your creditors. What if you don't have a security deposit for a secured credit card? Or what if you want to establish a second trade line? Another option is an unsecured credit card. Again, I'll put notes to all of this in the show notes for this episode over at Hoys.com, but it works just like a regular credit card. There is one card I know of that has a $1,000 credit limit, and you can even get it if you're in a bankruptcy or a consumer proposal. This card is not available if you're a second-time bankrupt or in a Division I proposal, so it's not an option for everyone. There is a monthly fee, and the interest rate is very high, so again, you would only get this card if you need to rebuild your credit, and you're able to afford the monthly fee, which, as I record this, is around $7 a month. Again, the point is to determine your goals, crunch the numbers, and know what you're getting into before applying for credit to start rebuilding your credit. I've got more tips, but first a quick break. You're listening to Debt Free in 30. You're listening to Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. That's our show for today. Full information on credit rebuilding is available at hoys.com. That's H-O-Y-E-S dot com. Thanks for listening. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30. Thanks for listening. That was Debt Free in 30. 